Zupełnie. Thank you very much, Andy. And um, hello, everybody. Good evening. This is um, my second Truth Juice lecture. My first one was last night in Leicester. Um, in fact, until a few weeks ago, I did not even know that this network existed. So this has been uh, quite a revelation for me, really. The fact that there are people, groups of people around the country committed like this to watching, learning about and spreading the truth about this increasingly complex world that we live in. I find this very inspiring and I, I know already that you do too. Um, okay, the Dr. Rath Health Foundation first. Let's start with that. This is the organisation that I work for. It's a non-profit organisation and it's based in the Netherlands. And we have a research institute, um, which I'll talk about in a moment, which is based in California. And the work of that institute, in a pretty major way, forms a big part of what I want to talk about tonight. This is a subject, really. It's always difficult with uh, subject titles to try to sum up the basis of one's talk in a title. But I tried, and this is it. And I'm going to try and explain it to you as well before we start. So you've got a, a grasp of what it is I want to talk about. So we have breakthrough scientific discoveries in natural health. And I'm going to be talking about emerging paradigms in the exposing of hidden histories. So there's an element of mystery there, which we'll get into in a little while. The breakthrough scientific discoveries part refers to the work of our research institute, which I'll be talking about. And the word scientific is there quite deliberately, because at the current time, whilst there are, all of us know, a great number of interesting, useful, natural therapies that perhaps all of us are using in various ways. Not all of them as yet have reached the status whereby they are scientifically proven in the sense that research has been published in what are called peer-reviewed scientific and medical journals. And when research reaches this status, when it has been peer-reviewed by other scientists working in the field, it becomes more credible to scientists and scientists will begin to look at it more seriously. I'm not going to get into why it is perhaps that some of the other therapies as yet haven't reached that status. That's a little bit outside the scope of what I want to talk about tonight. Um, but the emerging paradigms part refers to the fact that based upon the work that our guys are doing in California now, we can now chart a course towards what we think the healthcare systems of the future will look like. But there's other paradigms, as is always the case in this complex world of ours, emerging simultaneous to that. Because there's a culture of criticising these therapies, even trying to discredit them and ban them. And I've been talking about that as well. And I've been talking about the roots of th this criticism, this discrediting process, particularly in relation to the European Union, which plays a pretty major role in this. The hidden histories part relates to the history of the European Union and also some of the corporate interests that lay behind it, particularly in the field of health. So it's quite a lot, really. So here goes. This is our institute. It's located in Santa Clara in California. It was founded by Dr. Matthias Rath, the, the same doctor who founded the foundation that I work for. And it's headed by Dr. <coughs> Alexander Nitsviki. And what they do, we have about a dozen scientists working there. They conduct research using the natural substances that are found in foods, so vitamins, minerals, amino acids, phytonutrients, bioflavonoids, that sort of thing. This is important, really, because trying to prevent and treat and cure diseases at the current time depends upon the discovery and development and sale of multi-billion dollar pharmaceutical drugs. 
And this is the current paradigm. This is the paradigm that all of us are living in at the moment, in the sense that this is the paradigm that we've been force-fed, almost, from, from birth. The findings of our scientists have been published in peer-reviewed journals now. In fact, there's over 80 of them that I've counted on subjects such as cardiovascular disease, cancer, and all manner of other chronic diseases. And the point of this tonight, the reason that I came here tonight, the reason I accepted the invitation, was because based upon the breakthroughs of our scientists, we believe that it is now possible to envisage a world where chronic disease essentially becomes a thing of the past. And by that, what we mean, what our scientists mean when they say this, they say they envisage a future whereby the incidence of chronic diseases is essentially reduced to about one-tenth of what the current incidence of cardiovascular disease, cancer, and these others, diabetes, etc., are. A pretty major thing, really. Because when this happens, and it will happen, you know, we are living in a world where this is now within sight, when this happens, this will change almost everything. It will save, as I'll talk later, billions, even trillions of dollars that are spent in healthcare and economic costs of these diseases. There are three key discoveries, really, that we need to understand because they involve some of the biggest killers, the biggest killers of the industrialized world. What I'm going to do is quickly summarize these three breakthroughs. And then I want to go back and explain to you just how they work. Number one, it's that atherosclerosis, heart disease in, in common language, is essentially an early form of what used to be called the sailor's disease, scurvy. Scurvy is clinical vitamin C deficiency. And in, in centuries past, millions of seamen died during long sea voyages, because it wasn't understood that there was this thing called vitamin C that was so essential for health that you died if you didn't have a sufficient amount of it. So what we now know, and I'll come back to this in a little while, is that heart disease, at a very crucial level, the level of the cell, in fact, the human cells, involves vitamin C deficiency. Breakthrough number two is sort of related to that because we now know that micronutrient deficiency, that's shortages of vitamins and minerals and amino acids in the body, are essentially the underlying cause for most cardiovascular conditions today. For example, high blood pressure, heart failure, irregular heartbeats, and also the types of circulatory conditions that occur in diabetes. All of these have at their root cause deficiencies of essential micronutrients. Number three is a no less important, cancer. We now know that the spread of all cancer cells can be inhibited naturally, naturally without drugs. There are combinations of essential micronutrients which if used correctly can inhibit the spread of cancer. Major, major, major thing. I'll get later to why perhaps you didn't know this yet, but these are the three discoveries. To understand them, you have to understand something what our scientists call cellular medicine. If you can understand the foundations of cellular medicine, you've understood the basic principle behind the discoveries that I've been talking to you about so far. The most important principle is that diseases originate at the level of the cell, or rather the billions of cells that make up the human body. At the moment, when we go to the doctors with a problem, or to the hospital, we have entire departments that are dedicated to a single organ. We have the cardiology department. You know, we have a department that specializes in the kidney. You know, and it, it, modern medicine, on the one hand, it's portraying itself as so complicated and scientific. This is modern medicine. We are so lucky to be living in this age, this is what we're told. But in actual fact, what we now know is that diseases originate at the level of the cells. If you have, for example, a kidney problem, it's not the kidney itself per se that is sick, but rather the cells that make up the kidney, the kidney cells. And the problem 
boils down to shortages of key micronutrients in the cells. At the basic level, the function of a cell is simple enough that a child can understand it. In fact, we've used this very graphic here with children as a means of getting them to understand how what I've just said relates to the cell itself. So let's just go through this as a means of bringing you further into this understanding. The nucleus of the cell, the purple round blob there, this can be compared if one is comparing the cell to a city, to the city hall, because the nucleus contains all of the genetic information that's necessary to run the cell correctly. The city wall can be compared to the cell membrane because it separates the cell from the outside area from it. It protects the cell. The Golgi complex, that's the brownish sort of blob on the right-hand side there. This is like the city factory because it acts to process the larger molecules in the body, such as proteins and the fats. And finally, of particular importance, are the mitochondria. These are the sort of bluish, greyish things you see. There are several of these. And these can be compared to the power station, or the power stations of the cell, because they generate energy, cellular energy. If the cells are not able to produce energy, life cannot exist. For its very existence, we depend upon a supply of cellular energy. And here's the point of all this, because micronutrients, the vitamins, the minerals, the amino acids that we're talking about, these act as cofactors in the production of cellular energy. And when the body is deficient, or rather when the cells are deficient in micronutrients, this is when cellular malfunction occurs. And if it goes on for long enough, and if the deficiencies become serious enough, this is when we develop problems with, with our internal organs. And a chronic deficiency of micronutrients is the most common cause, the most common root cause of chronic diseases today. Our diets are becoming starved of micronutrients. There's separate independent research in several countries around the world now has shown that the micronutrient content of our diets is a fraction of what it was 50 and 70 years ago. Research in the US, there's a few of you nodding your heads here, so I'm pleased to see you know this. The US, Canada, the Netherlands, and the UK. There's been research published showing this to be a fact. And of course, you only have to stand in your supermarket to see the stuff that people put in their trolleys and consume as their fuel. To see that people are also, irrespective of the fact that the fruit and vegetables are becoming deficient in micronutrients, people are eating stuff that doesn't barely contain them anyway which makes the problem even worse. <laughs> Let's look, take a look now at how these basic, easy to understand principles can be applied and are being applied to cardiovascular disease. Cardiovascular disease is the biggest killer of the industrialized world. And if we can crack that, and we can, we can make huge strides towards eradicating a major killer of our time. To begin with, we need to in the interest of truth, we need to know the truth about cholesterol. Because the way it's being presented to us is that cholesterol is sort of the big enemy, really. Cholesterol is what we must fear. We must fight the cholesterol in our bodies. And take these expensive statin drugs, you know, as if cholesterol is some sort of enemy advancing over the hill towards us. It's not like that. In fact, I'm sure there'll be one or two hands will go up here. Tell me, put up your hand if you know, if you knew that cholesterol, before tonight, not from reading this, did you know that cholesterol is an, actually an essential substance in the body? Put your hand up if you knew. Ah, oh, this is fantastic. I knew I'd enjoy coming here. This is good. This is very good. That's all your link. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, it's not the enemy, and it's essential in the production of hormones in the body. And vitamin D, we know that sunshine acting on the skin produces vitamin D. But did you know that cholesterol plays an important part in that process? And if you reduce your body's levels of cholesterol to you know, dramatically low levels, you're making it much, much harder for your body to produce vitamin D from the sun. So statin drugs are not the answer because cholesterol isn't the problem. And I'm gonna explain why that is in a moment. 
And nor is this the answer. I mean, I don't know if you can see this. This is what heart bypass surgery looks like. I mean, just take a look at this. This is what happens. This is what happens when the blockages in your arteries become such that surgeons decide the only way around the problem is to extract veins from your legs and stitch them around the blockages in the arteries. I mean, it's brutal. It really is. You really, really, really do not want this to happen to you. To do this, they have to stop the heart, okay? To, to, to perform heart bypass surgery, they have to stop the heartbeat. And then respiration is carried out artificially. Then afterwards, after they're finished with the stitching of the, of the veins around the arteries, then the heart has to be restarted. It's really major stuff. And it's underestimated how dangerous this is. There's that little thing at the bottom of the sentence there. Research now suggests that over half of heart disease patients who have this procedure end up with measurable damage to the brain. Okay? So that's a good reason why you really, really want to try to avoid this happening to you. So the truth about cholesterol and heart disease, and here it is. What our scientists have found is that high cholesterol is not the cause of heart disease, it's the consequence of it. High cholesterol happens as a result of heart disease. What do I mean by that? Well, in the course of its normal operation and beating to pump the blood around our body every day to keep us alive, the arteries sustain damage. I'll explain why that is in a moment. But the arteries become damaged through the action of the heart. Under normal circumstances, the body can repair this damage using vitamin C, lysine, and other micronutrients that go together to produce something called collagen. Collagen is the connective glue that glues the tissue of our bodies together. Without collagen, our bones and our muscles and things would not literally hold together. This is why, for example, in scurvy, the end clinical scurvy results in major hemorrhages occurring in the body. It's because essentially the tissues of the body are starting to fall apart because the body can't produce the collagen to hold everything together. When the body has enough vitamin C and lysine, it can repair the damage to the arteries, okay? But nature's very clever, we know this. You guys are the experts in this, you listen to this every week, week in, week out. Nature's very clever, because nature in the body has found a way around the problem. Because when the body is short of vitamin C and lysine, what the body will do is use, or if it has to, produce cholesterol to affect repairs to the damaged arteries. And actually, cholesterol works quite well in a way, but the problem is, is if the damage continues, and if the body isn't resupplied with vitamin C to affect repair, this eventually results in the diameter of the arteries becoming narrowed with increased cholesterol production. And lesions start to narrow the diameter of the arteries. And this obviously raises the risk of heart attacks and strokes. So, why does the damage occur? Well, it's sort of simple, again, beautifully simple. Think about this, your heart pumps, on average, around 100,000 times a day. And this pumping, it has to be sufficient to propel the blood around the body. <coughs> the arteries coming from the heart bear the brunt of the force, of the pressure of the blood as the heart does this 100,000 times a day. And in the course of that, minute cracks and pieces of damage occur to the arteries. And this is what the body will repair using vitamin C and lysine, as long as it has enough. Once you know that, once you understand why it is that the body is putting cholesterol in the arteries as a secondary repair mechanism, if you like, it answers quite a few interesting questions that doctors are never even encouraged to consider. For example, we know we get heart attacks, but why don't we get ear attacks or nose attacks? The answer to that is, is that the veins in the body are not subject to the same force of blood flow as are the arteries coming from the heart. So the body isn't needing 
to affect repair mechanisms using cholesterol. We have atherosclerosis, the furring, the narrowing of the arteries of the heart. There's no such thing as venosclerosis. Of all of the countless miles of blood vessels in the body, medicine has sort of ignored the fact that, isn't it unusual that the only place where the body puts cholesterol is the arteries? Cholesterol never appears in the vein system of the body. There is something else, because in the animal world, heart attacks are essentially unknown. They're very, very, very rare. The vast majority of the animal kingdom is able to produce its own vitamin C in its liver. And it does this from glucose. It's actually, for the technically minded amongst you, it's a four-stage enzyme process. And human beings, us, and the apes, and guinea pigs, and I think there's a species of bat and bird, we've lost this ability. We only have three of the necessary enzymes. We can't make our own vitamin C. So we are dependent on getting it from our diets or from supplements. The bear is also an interesting aspect of this because bears have incredibly high levels of cholesterol. If you went to your doctor with a level of cholesterol comparable to that of a bear, he'd be begging you, he'd be ordering you to take statins. But of course, the fact that we still have bears walking the planet tells us it gives us further evidence that there must be something wrong with the cholesterol theory of heart disease. Because if it was really, really true, we wouldn't have any bears. They'd all have died out from these stratospheric levels of cholesterol they have in their blood. So, to prevent atherosclerosis, to prevent heart disease, you need an optimum supply of micronutrients. You need micronutrient-dense foods or supplements. And by doing that, you can replenish the vitamin levels in the cells of your artery and produce sufficient collagen to keep them strong. And this will, through, through preventing damage to the arteries and repairing any damage that occurs, you will help to prevent heart attack and stroke. We know this works in patients because we have X-ray photographs of before and after. And this is a good one. This patient had serious coronary artery disease. And this photograph shows a section of an artery that had coronary artery plaques. And you can see the before and after. After the cellular medicine approach was applied, the plaques, not just in this artery, but all of the arteries in this patient, disappeared. So we know this works in patients. And around the world, there are now already doctors taking advantage of this approach. Dr. Rath has written a book, which you can read online for free, about this subject. It's called Why Animals Don't Get Heart Attacks, But People Do. You can read it online and learn all about this. There's a lot more. This is a basic summary I'm giving you here. You can download the chapters as PDFs. Or if, or if you want, if you prefer a hard copy, you can buy one. But this is information that exists now. It's the result of peer-reviewed studies, and it's there to take advantage of. Here's an interesting thing. This man here was Dr. Albert Sven-Georgi. He was the guy who actually discovered and isolated vitamin C, and he won a Nobel Prize for it in 1937. In 1970, in a letter to another Nobel Prize winner, Dr. Linus Pauling, Sven-Georgi stated that he was already convinced that the medical profession was misleading the public about his discovery and the importance of it. And this is what he said. He said, right from the beginning, he meant from 1937, bear in mind, I felt that the medical profession misled the public. He said, if you don't take ascorbic acid, that's vitamin C, with your food, you get scurvy, clinical vitamin C deficiency. So the medical profession said that if you don't get scurvy, you're all right. He said, I think that this is a very grave error. 40 years ago he wrote this letter, 1970. Scurvy is not the first sign of the deficiency, but a pre-mortal syndrome, meaning the stage of the disease that leads towards death if it's not corrected. And for full health, you need much more, very much more, 
He said, I am taking myself about one gram a day. That's a thousand milligrams. The RDA is 60 milligrams, by the way. This does not mean that this is really the optimum dose, because we do not know what full health really means and how much ascorbic acid, vitamin C, you need for it. He said, what I can tell you is that one can take any amount of ascorbic acid without the least danger. Now, think about that for a moment. The man who discovered and isolated vitamin C and won a prize, a Nobel Prize, biggest prize in science the world has for doing it, said that the medical profession misled the public about his discovery right from the start, he said. 1937, okay? For those of you who think there might have been a cover-up, well, that's clearly where it might have started. But he said that any amount of ascorbic acid can be taken without the least danger. What a different message to that that we're getting from our government and our Department of Health and our doctors. Isn't it? <laughs> I mean, he's, he's not, he, 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 he didn't put an upper limit, you know, and he was the expert. He was the expert, serious, serious research. He knew what he was talking about. But we haven't been told about this, have we? Okay, let's have a look now at how cellular medicine applies to cancer, because it does. And the, the discoveries here are no less important. Cancer is sort of viewed as a death sentence, really. Aside from perhaps AIDS, it's the one diagnosis that patients fear more than perhaps any other. But what we now know is that all cancer cells, regardless of what organ the tumor is located in, all cancer cells have something in common. And it's this, is that they all produce biological cutting tools. By that I mean enzymes that are able to eat their way through tissue. Collagen digesting enzymes, in fact. We talked about collagen before, so if you're paying attention, you now know what collagen is. You see, because for cancer cells to spread, they have to be able to pass through collagen. If they can pass through collagen, they can reach the bloodstream and then be carried to more distant areas of the body. And the more of these collagen digesting enzymes that cancer cells produce, we now know that this means the more malignant the tumour is and the more likely the demise of the patient will be unless corrective action is taken. This little graphic sort of illustrates what I've just been talking about. Because, as I said, to, to reach the bloodstream, the cancer cells have to eat collagen, they dissolve their way through collagen. And then, at the other end, to leave the bloodstream, again, they eat their way through collagen and become lodged in other parts of the body. The result being metastasis, the spreading of cancer to other parts of the body. <coughs> so the message here is that a group of key micronutrients have been shown in scientific peer-reviewed studies to block cancer cells naturally. And these include vitamin C, again, and lysine, the amino acid we talked about, and also some of the poly polyphenol extracts that are found in green tea. And these can block the cancer cell collagen digesting enzymes naturally without the use of chemotherapy or any of these other drugs. In fact, our institute has published more studies on the subject of cancer than anything else. They've now had, our scientists, over 50 studies published in this area. And what they've found, first of all in the laboratory, is that this particular combination of micronutrients is effective in preventing the development and growth of all human cancer cells available. And I use that word advisedly. This is what they are saying. This graph on the bottom shows the micronutrient concentration. In the human body, that's equivalent to the dose, if you like. The concentration of this group of micronutrients. The vertical axis on the left there shows the degree to which the cancer cells are being inhibited. If you go far enough along with the dose, you reach a point. The example here is four particular types of cancer cells, but it applies to all of them. We could have put any of the various different cancer cell names there. 
At a certain point, our scientists, with every cancer cell available for study, they have found 100% inhibition. Imagine if that was a drug, okay? Imagine that I was from one of the major pharmaceutical companies and I was standing here and saying, hey guys, we got a great discovery, we got a drug. It will be on the front page of every paper in the country tomorrow. It will be on the top news item of every radio and TV program in the country. Well, we have that, but it's not a drug. It's a combination of specific micronutrients. Why haven't we heard about it? The information's out there. We know it works. Here we have before and after MRI scans showing the successful treatment of a brain tumour in a female patient using these protocols. There was barely a year elapsed between the, the, uh, the scan on the left and the scan on the right. The tumour there was actually what's called the glioma, a particular type of brain tumour. This one here concerns the treatment of lung cancer. These these, these x-rays here are over 10 years old. The patient's still alive today. He's in his 80s. He's doing very well. No tumours. We know this works. There are patients who are alive today who would not be alive were it not for this research. There's a book about this. If this is the one that interests you, this subject, you can read this online for free. You can download the chapters as PDFs. Or if you prefer the hard copy, you can buy the book. But this is information that saved lives. The, the, the approaches in this book have been shown to block all mechanisms, because there are other mechanisms as well, all mechanisms that make cancer a deadly disease. We didn't just begin tonight, last week, or last month, or even last year, spreading this information. Dr. Arthur and his researchers went public about 10 years ago. In fact, it was 10 years ago, this month, in fact. And they made a presentation at the breast cancer conference in Miami. But they were concerned that the importance of this research would not result in it being brought to patients quickly enough. In fact, their feelings were right. But what they did at the same time, they put a full page advertisement in the USA Today newspaper, which is the largest circulation newspaper in the United States. <laughs> because they wanted to get this out into the public domain as quickly as possible, for obvious reasons. This research saves lives. But for three years, not very much happened, really. But then this happened. In 2005, the world's largest research institute, the US government-funded National Institutes of Health, published a study in the official journal of the United States National Academy of Sciences, and this study said that vitamin C selectively kills cancer cells. The word selectively is important because this describes the difference between vitamin C and chemotherapy. Chemotherapy, as I'm sure all of us know, is incredibly toxic. The, the loss of hair, the extreme weakness, the, one sees in late stage cancer patients is the result of the treatment, not the disease. But you see, chemotherapy can't distinguish between healthy cells and normal cells. It wreaks havoc on all the cells of the body. And it works sort of because it's slightly more lethal to the cancer cells than it is to the healthy cells. But the patient survives at a cost. Vitamin C, as confirmed by the US government, in 2005, selectively kills cancer cells. You see, this is the thing about drugs, isn't it, really? Have you ever thought about this? You take, the doctor gives you a drug, says, here, take this. You, know, you have a, whatever, a liver problem, let's say. Here, take this, this is what you need. How does the drug know where to go? Yeah? Have, you ever, have you ever thought about that? How does the drug know where to go? How does it know to go that, here? It reaches the bloodstream, how does it know? Well, it doesn't. And this is why drugs have side effects, you see. Vitamin C, the body needs. It uses vitamin C for health. It's essential for life. So vitamin C is selectively lethal to cancer cells, but it leaves normal cells, healthy cells, unharmed. Okay. At this point, we have to ask ourselves why we haven't heard about these breakthroughs before. Why you haven't heard about these breakthroughs before. Either I'm lying to you, I've made this up, or I'm 
this is a case of extreme exaggeration, or there's something going on here that you haven't been told about, that our doctors are largely ignorant about, because they are. You try telling some of this stuff to your doctor, maybe some of you already have, and you know, I, I know what they say. They say, if this was true and important, surely I would have been taught about it in medical school. Yeah? <laughs> well, part of the reason comes down to this. A few years ago, when I first got interested in this area in the course of my work for the foundation, I decided to sit down because I kept hearing everywhere that the pharma industry was sort of at the centre of everything really, in the arena of health. So I looked at some of the, the major bodies and groups that were involved in the sort of global healthcare scene. The United Nations and some of its organisations, some of the major drug producing countries, some of the major bits of legislation, and then CAC is the Codex, Codex Armentarius Commission, for those of you who know something about that, and some of its committees. But what I found was that more lines lead in terms of the connections to the pharma industry than anything else. Codex has quite a few, but the pharma industry lies at the centre of all of it. We still have this on our websites. You can go to this and you can click on these little buttons and see what the links are, the little hyperlinks that take you to other stuff to show you other stuff. And then when I gave this to uh, the guy in our layout department, I said, design me a thing that looks interesting that can show this. So he put the spider at the centre. He said to me, it looks like a web. And he's sort of right, really, so we sort of stuck with it. But it's the influence of the pharma industry. This is the major reason why you haven't heard about this. Again, we've sort of been encouraged to see the pharma industry as a type of Mother Teresa, really. Something that's there, making these marvellous discoveries that's going to help us to live healthily forever after. But it's not like that. The pharma industry's main responsibility is to its shareholders. First and foremost, it's about profits. About shareholder value. That's the first responsibility. Also, think about this. Is it in the industry, the pharma industry's interests, to produce a drug that cures a disease? Or is it better for profits to produce something that patients take day in, day out, for the rest of their lives? And patients become dependent on these drugs. Patients become long-time users. That's better for business. The pharma industry isn't interested in cures, because cures do not produce shareholder value in the same way as long-term dependency on drugs do. And get this, our government knows about this, okay? In 2005, it actually published this, this report called The Influence of the Pharmaceutical Industry. For about one day, it was reported in, on the BBC News website, then it was just sort of buried, it was lost, and nothing happened. But the report, this, it was, the report was done by the House of Commons Health Committee, okay? It describes the influence of the industry as pervasive and persistent. It talks about drug safety problems. It talks about drug-induced disease, meaning diseases caused by the drugs patients are taking for other problems. And it also stated that there's not enough research done comparing drug and non-drug research. In fact, some of the people who took part in the inquiry openly stated that there's little commercial interest in non-drug approaches. Well, we know why that is, don't we? You see, the pharmaceutical industry has incredible control over the global economy. I don't have the figures for last year yet, but in 2010, global pharmaceutical sales were worth $875 billion. Not million, $875 billion. So just short of a trillion, in other words. Most of the industry estimates expect that within three years, global pharmaceutical sales will be worth around $1,100 billion. That's $1.1 trillion. <laughs> this raises all sorts of questions, really, because I'm sure in Birmingham, the same as where I live, on a, on a Saturday morning, you have people shaking tins saying, you know, give generously to you know, heart disease research or give generously to kidney disease research. <laughs> if we have a one trillion dollar industry centered around the production and sale of drugs, <laughs> why does it need our money? Yeah? <laughs> why do we have to give to research when it turns over a thousand billion dollars a year? 
It's, you know, <laughs> absolutely. I mean, it doesn't make sense, you know. And the thing is, you see, with drugs, you can patent a drug. And this is why they do it, because if you invent a synthetic molecule, a non-natural molecule, you own it. It's yours. And if you're the first to do this in a certain area of healthcare, you control the market. Controlling markets is big dollars. It's hundreds of billions of dollars it can be. But of course, vitamins and natural healthcare approaches, herbs and things, can't be patented. Albert sven Georgi discovered and isolated vitamin C, but he couldn't say he invented it. It was invented by nature. It was put there as an essential component of our food and our bodies. The global economic costs of chronic disease dwarf even the amounts of money the pharmaceutical industry makes. The economic cost of cancer alone per year is around one trillion dollars globally. Get that, one trillion dollars, the economic cost of a single disease. Heart disease is almost as much, 863 billion dollars a year at the last count. But the World Economic Forum has done studies in this area. And a couple of years ago, they examined the impact of five leading chronic diseases, cancer, diabetes, mental illness, heart disease, and respiratory disease. And they estimated that over the next 20 years, the economic, the total economic cost of just those five diseases is going to be around 47 trillion dollars. I mean, we're getting into mind-boggling amounts of money now. And it, you know, I guess in government, there probably are people who are saying, yes, but the pharma industry makes a, a useful contribution to the global economy. <laughs> That's not even true either. You know, compare those figures. You know, a trillion dollars economic cost of cancer alone. You know, the industry makes a trillion dollars. It's not contributing more than it's actually costing us. We have drugs that don't work, that are toxic. And we have approaches that do work, but they're not being used. <laughs> and then we come to the EU. I've been talking a lot more about the EU and its role in all this in the second half of the talk. But the EU's stated aim, right, is to become the pharmacy of the world. And I put those words on the slide there deliberately because at the press conference a couple of years ago to announce a 2 billion euro scheme to boost drug discovery, they actually used those words. That was what they said. They want the EU to become the pharmacy of the world. The world's main drug producer. <laughs> I mean, it is insanity. It really is. I'm going to finish this half with just a little look at the part, if you go back to what I said at the start this evening, about the paradigms. I've talked about the paradigm of health that's emerging, our understanding of health and nutrition and how this relates to the human body. But there are other paradigms emerging. And not just the paradigm of trying to undermine the credibility of these therapies, but the EU is actually actively trying to ban our access to these therapies. There are three examples, there are many examples in the EU regulatory arena. That's probably a, a talk in itself, I guess. But there are three that are most important of all that you need to know about. Number one is something called the Food Supplement Directive. And this was passed in 2002. And what this does is to set restrictions on the doses and the types of vitamins and minerals that can be obtained in supplements. The doses haven't been set yet, but restrictions on the types of vitamins and minerals already have. The dose is a critical aspect of this because clearly, based upon the research I've talked about so far, you can see the importance of getting enough micronutrients. <coughs> but the EU is pretending, you see, that when it sets these maximum permitted amounts, that this will be done scientifically by a process it calls scientific risk assessment. If we have time, I'm going to share something with you now. Dead easy, simple to understand. I'm going to tell you that their process for scientific risk assessment is deeply flawed for several reasons, but I'm going to explain the key one to you. I promise you, if you listen, you'll all understand this. And then, when eventually they make these announcements, you'll see, you'll be able to understand and say, hey, I know why that's wrong, and it's this. 
They want to set, we'll take the example of vitamin C, okay? They want to set one level for vitamin C. Sounds fair enough. You know, we can all sit here hoping that it's going to be enough. But, but, there are more than one type. There is more than one type of vitamin C. Vitamin C is not one chemical entity. Earlier on the Albert Sven Georgi slides there, you saw ascorbic acid. That's the acid form of vitamin C. And if you take a large, a large, large amount of ascorbic acid, it can produce loose bowels. Okay? When we've all heard this, you know, vitamin C, too much diarrhea. Okay, well, the answer to that's simple. You take less or you stop, whichever you prefer. But other forms of vitamin C, vitamin C complex with minerals, for example, calcium, Calcium ascorbate, the calcium ascorbate type of vitamin C, does not cause loose bowels in the same way that ascorbic acid does. And there are other types, magnesium ascorbate, that's ascorbic acid complex with magnesium, potassium ascorbate, zinc ascorbate, you get the idea. But what they want to do is to set one level. So what they'll do, they'll set a level that they say is sufficient to assume that nobody will possibly get loose bowels, even a little bit, from vitamin C. Ignoring the fact you can take far more of other types of vitamin C and not run into the same problem. This applies to all of the vitamins and minerals, okay? Take iron. If you are anemic and you go to your doctor, you say, doctor, I've got a headache, I've got, I'm, I'm feeling very weak and I'm not sleeping properly, he'll take a blood test. And if he finds you are anemic, and if he finds that the anemia is due to a lack of iron, he will give you a type of iron called iron uh, ferrous sulfate. Ferrous sulfate is easily the most toxic of all the forms of iron. It can cause nausea, vomiting, stomach upsets, headaches, it's really nasty stuff. Other forms of iron don't have those properties. Iron bisglycinate, for example. But one level will be set for all types of iron. And obviously that will be set at the level that's appropriate to ensure that there are no toxic effects from ferrous sulfate. Ignoring the fact that other forms of iron are less toxic. Do you understand? Yeah? It's simple, really. You know, that approach they are taking is called the nutrient group approach. They should be taking the approach that any other scientist in any other field, working in pesticides or something, they look at individual discrete chemicals. That's the scientific approach. But they don't want to do that. Two more. Then we'll take a short break. The EU's traditional herbal medicinal products directive, as its name suggests, is orientated towards banning herbal remedies. And what it does, it subjects them to a really restrictive regulatory regime, whereby unless they are specifically granted a license, they have to be just removed from the market. Already around Europe, we're seeing herbs disappearing from health food store shelves at an alarming rate because of this legislation. Herbs that have been used for millennia are suddenly said to be unsafe unless they're granted a license. And then, in some ways, we have perhaps the most insidious piece of legislation of all. We have something called the Regulation on Nutrition and Health Claims. Because what this does, it tries to prevent the spreading of information about natural health therapies. It's one thing having vitamin C available, for example, but unless you know what it does, unless the producer of vitamin C can tell you what it does and how to use it, it's not as much, it's not as much useful. So this legislation bans all implications, sort of, not just nutrients, but foods have specific properties. I mean, there's two absurd, really ridiculous examples here. Prune juice, right? We all know our grandmothers told us that prune juice is useful for getting the bowels moving if you have chronic constipation. That's a phrase I never thought I'd say in front of an audience. Chronic constipation. Um, yeah, you know, this sort of information has been handed down from grandmother to daughter for, you know, hundreds of years. How to use foods for health. And yet the EU has banned prune juice manufacturers from saying that prunes help to keep the bowels going, or words to that effect. 
And then water. I mean, maybe some of you have heard of this. At the moment, it's illegal for bottled water manufacturers to say that water helps prevent dehydration. <laughs> Uh, why that is, I don't know. Maybe there's a drug that might be able to replace it. I don't know. I'm joking. Um, but yeah, this is, this is the level of absurdity that the EU is descending to in its desperation. Because that's what it is. If a body, a political body, stoops to such idiotic and easily provable points, you know, we know it's desperate. It can only be desperate to prevent the communication of natural health information. But what we know then, that if it prevents the communication of truthful and non-misleading information, that to all intents and purposes, the EU is a political dictatorship. We only see prohibitions on freedom of speech in political dictatorships. And this is what the EU is becoming. Some would say it's what it already is, in fact. We'll take a break now. In the second half, I'm going to be talking about the origins of this thing we call the EU. And I promise you, you're going to hear some things that you will never have heard before. For now. Okay. So I hope everybody is suitably refreshed after our little break. So where we left off was at the point where we were looking at some of the legislation that the European Union is bringing in in the area of natural therapies. And I told you that I'm going to tell you something about the origins of the European Union that you may not previously have known about. I guess because we are a, a research-based organisation, we have a great belief in the idea that if you want to say something, if you want to prove something, the way you do that in science is through scientific research, published research, but in the political arena and in the historical arena, one requires equally substantive and valid documentation. The reason I say this is that when we first started looking several years ago at the area of regulation of natural products, and when we looked at what the EU is doing in this area. And we figured that the EU, like the British government, knows about this, the research that I'm telling you about tonight. We decided to investigate a couple of things that we previously heard and read about, but did not have what we considered to be substantive proof for. So we went trawling through international archives around the world, looking to see if we could substantiate things about the origins of the European Union that we've been reading about. So the next part of my talk is going to be about the historical roots of the European Union. But not just that. This is not going to be just a history lesson. But I'm going to explain how these roots relate to the situation we find ourselves in today as regards the healthcare systems that we're currently living with in Britain, in Europe, and the world today. These are some of the documents, by the way, but in actual fact, we uncovered literally tens of thousands of documents, and I'm going to show you some of the key ones next. To begin this little uh, historical trip, we have to go back to 1941. And this was a time at which the, the Second World War was two years old. And at that time, the, the Nazi regime in Germany was maintaining several official institutes. But what we discovered is that these institutes have or had one 
purpose only. And it was this, it was to prepare the future political and economic shape of the world for an assumed Nazi victory in World War II. It wasn't just the Nazis, however, who were perceived by these institutes to be the key beneficiaries of the victory in World War II. It was also an industrial cartel called IG Farben. And I will say a bit more about that as we, as we move on. But one of these institutes was headed by this man here, whose name was Arno Scholter. And his planning office, his research office, his institute was based in Dresden, in Germany. And in 1941, Scholter and his institute published this book here. And this book is a fascinating book. We have a, translations of it on our websites. And the reason it's important is because the Europe it describes, the Europe that it envisaged coming about following a Nazi victory in World War II, bears some astonishing resemblances to the European Union of today. For example, I mean, I'm going to give three examples, in fact. The first one is the blueprint includes a, a comparable description in very many ways of what we now know as the European Commission. For anybody who doesn't know, the European Commission consists of 27 <coughs> people. These are the most powerful technocrats in Europe. They essentially amount to being the executive body of the European Union. They don't stand for election, of course. There's one from each of the 27 European Union member states, but none of them stand for election. But these are the most powerful technocrats in Europe today. And the Commission and the way it produces drafts of legislation that are ultimately handed down to the member states to implement is described in Salter's book. In fact, it describes a system and it actually uses the, the term directives. It calls them directives. The system whereby these texts are handed down for the member states to implement is in Salter's book. But not just that, it also talks about the finalisation of what it called a master agreement. And this master agreement was intended to be the final key agreement that would govern any future changes that were made in the Europe <coughs> that the Nazis intended to control and bring about after World War II. And this master agreement, the way it's described, bears a, an uncanny resemblance to what we now know as the Lisbon Treaty, the most recent of the European Union treaties that was passed and signed and finalised a couple of years ago. And I'm going to say a bit more about that in a little while. But it wasn't just Schulte's book that gave rise to our suspicions that there may be more to the origins of the European Union than we had previously suspected. Because one of the things we did, we obtained copies of documents from the Nuremberg war crimes trials. Now, after World War II, there were 13 separate trials in which the main Nazis and the main war criminals were tried at Nuremberg. Many of them were hanged for their crimes. But there were two of the 13 trials that interested us particularly. One was the so-called doctor's trial, which involved medical experimentation. But the other one was against the cartel I mentioned earlier, IG Farben. IG Farben was a pharmaceutical and chemical cartel, and it consisted of the companies Bayer, BASF, and what was then known as Herx essentially became merged into what we now know as Sanofi Aventis. And this man here was Fritz Termier. He was a senior director of the IG Farben cartel. And the interesting thing is that in the trial documents, it describes how Termier's legal counsel, a man by the name of Dr. Burnt, specifically stated that the concept of what he called a total European economic area had shaped his client, meaning to me, his aims. The concept of a total European economic area. It was, I guess, 
Burnt meant it as a sort of a defense for Tamir. He was sort of saying, well, yes, you know, my client stands of some appalling, heinous crimes, but his aims were honorable. His aims were to bring about the creation of a total European economic area. It wasn't a very good defense, but it was a defense that he made, but it's very telling. To me, he was ultimately found guilty at Nuremberg of plunder, spoliation, slavery, and mass murder. And he was condemned by the court to seven years imprisonment. <laughs> it doesn't feel right to laugh about that. I, I try to stay solemn about that, but it is laughable. It would be laughable, sorry, if it were not so serious. But point taken. The Nuremberg trial against I.G. Farben made specific reference and extensive discussion and extensive evidence about what happened at Auschwitz, the concentration camp. Now, this was a picture, a period picture from the time. I went to Auschwitz a couple of years ago and it looks pretty much the same now. But over the gates, there's this famous slogan here which essentially translates as work frees you, work liberates you. Freedom through work, that's a good one. Uh, we were talking about this earlier, I asked Lynn who knows German, how do you, what would be the best way to translate that? Dr. Rath gave me work liberates you, but I guess you get the point. Question, what does this slogan reveal about the true purpose of Auschwitz at its onset? Well, this was revealed during the trial against Farben. It's this, because the Auschwitz concentration camp inmates were used as a source of slave labour at nearby industrial plants. And the site of what was known as IG Auschwitz was the largest and single most important, in fact, of these sites. But more importantly, IG Auschwitz was a 100% subsidiary of IG Farben. There's a, an aerial picture of the site just there. It's located a few miles from the concentration camp. And at the time, it was the largest industrial plant of its type in the world. But the Nuremberg trial proved that Tamir and Farben were responsible for the construction and the operation of this plant. They were using the Auschwitz inmates as a source of slave labor. <coughs> When you go to Auschwitz, it's, if any of you have been, you'll know that it's quite an experience. It's something that when you've been, you never forget, really. But when you went, did you, did you visit? Had you even heard about the IG Auschwitz site? No, no. It's still there, in fact. You go a few miles up the road and the site is still there. This is one of my photographs. I took it down the back. It's largely disused. There are some parts that are still used, but largely it's disused. It's not part of the, I guess, the official history of Auschwitz that we've come to know, but it was described in great detail in the Nuremberg trial documents relating to the IG Farben post-war trial. And of these documents, I guess the most shocking were the ones relating to the criminal medical experiments that were conducted on the inmates at Auschwitz. But you see, even here, it turns out that we've been misled. And I'm putting it politely there. Because we've essentially been told that the experiments conducted on the inmates of Auschwitz were conducted by crazy Nazi officers who were essentially insane. Well, the documents, which we have online, by the way, on our Profit Over Life website, you see the address just there. And th we have specific links to specific sections. If you go to the, uh, I think it's key contents link on the site, you can go straight to this and read it for yourself. We've been told that these were conducted by crazy Nazis and that these SS officers and people were insane. Well, the Auschwitz information that came out in the Nuremberg war crimes trial against Farber says something very different. Because it turns out that the deadly tests also included tests of drugs produced by the IG Farben companies. This man here was Helmuth Vetter. He was a paid employee of Bayer. 
and he conducted tests on Auschwitz inmates. In fact, some of the chemicals used in these tests subsequently went on to become the first generation of chemotherapy drugs. So, in fact, it can be said that testing carried out at Auschwitz subsequently went on to make billions of dollars of profits for chemotherapy manufacturers. We even know from the trial what some of these chemicals were. And I mean, this photograph here, you can see at the top the name, Bayer. It's preparation, BE. 1034 produced by Bayer. This is one of the buildings at Auschwitz. This is a photograph Dr. Rath took of me, in fact, standing outside it. The plaque here to the left describes that medical experiments took place there, but it doesn't include this part of the history that I'm telling you about, the part of the history that's contained in the Nuremberg trial documents. As this gentleman knows, it's a pretty inhospitable place. When I, when I went, I went in January, which was quite the coldest time of the year. Night, the temperatures got down to about minus 20 or something. Truly unbelievable that anybody could survive something like that. The, the camp was surrounded and also divided with electrified fencing. As you walk around, it's, there is, it's something you never forget. I mean, as you can tell, words don't very often fail you, but it's something when you've been there, you, you never forget. But photographs like this of the victims of these experiments, which include children, have stayed away from the facts that are documented in the trial documents against Farben from Nuremberg. And this is something, this is a truth that we have not been told about. It's a truth that has not been shared with us. And yet, here's the other thing, despite Tamir's crimes, and despite the seven years, which is an appallingly short sentence, I'm sure all of us would agree, he was released after only two years. And then, in 1956, obviously aware that he was a convicted war criminal, Bayer employed him as chairman of its supervisory board. And he went on to hold that post for another eight years. When you look on the Bayer website, there's no mention, of course, of Tamir. It mentions everybody else subsequent. But Tamir was re-employed, essentially, by his old employers. But there's more, because we're really only touching the surface here, scratching the surface of what there is to know about the historical roots of the Europe that emerged following the Second World War. Because there are things that we don't know about the first and founding president of the European Commission. This man was Walter Hallstein. Walter Hallstein is seen by the EU as one of its key founding fathers, and for sure he played a major role in its creation of the bloc. He held the presidency of the Commission for nine years, between 1958 and 1967. What we now know from documents I'll show you next, is that before and during World War II, Hallstein was a member of official Nazi organisations. There were two associations of lawyers. Hallstein was a lawyer. He was a Nazi lawyer. And one of these associations, the so-called Nazi Association of Law Protectors, was restricted in its membership to those Nazi lawyers who showed uncompromising support for Nazi ideology. We know that Hallstein was a member of these organisations because we found this, a memorandum written by him to the Nazi representative at the University of Rostock in Germany. So we know of his membership because he wrote about it in 1935. But there's something else. Of everything we've found about Hallstein, there's one thing that stands out more than anything else in giving us a view into the mindsets of the man who became the founding president of the European Commission. And it's this, this is a modern day photograph of a venue where a speech he gave in 1939, January 1939, just before the outbreak of war 
was given. And the content of this speech, through revealing what they reveal about the mindset of Hausstein, not only confirm some of the other things I've said earlier, which I'll describe in a moment, but they will change our understanding of how the European Union came about and from what precisely it grew. A key aspect of this speech concerned what Hausstein, Hausstein described as the link-up. He used this phrase in the speech, the link-up, to describe the linking up of Austria and what, were, what was then known as Czechoslovakia, or a large part of Czechoslovakia, with Germany. But you see, he didn't describe these countries as having been invaded. He didn't say that they were seized. He said that there was a link-up and he described it, in fact, as the creation of the greater German Reich. And get this, the legal Germanization of the new territories. Because remember, Hallstein was a lawyer. To Hallstein, the seizing of these countries was a legal matter. First and foremost, the legal Germanization of the new territories. But also, he specifically stated that the, the failure to create what he described as a unified legal system for greater Germany was one of the, and I quote, one of the unfinished tasks and failures of the Second German Reich. Now, the Second German Reich, for anybody who doesn't know, covers the period through the end of the 19th century up to the First World War. So what he was essentially saying here was that, well, had we created a unified legal system for greater Germany, then perhaps we'd have been more successful. He considered it to be one of the unfinished matters relating to the First World War. But there's something else, because we then get into an area of the speech where we start to see corroboration from some of the other elements I've described to you so far. Because he also described the legal process for the creation of this legal system as being the issuing of directives. So now we have Arno Schulte's book talking about the issuing of directives being the Nazis' preferred ways of doing things after the war. And we have Hallstein, just prior to the war, saying that the legal process for Greater Germany should involve the issuing of directives as a means of implementing legislation. There's something else, because he actually described the creation of this Greater German Reich of being an economic event. He said it was an economic event of sheer unimaginable consequences. I think we can give him the last part in the sense that the consequences of World War II were certainly unimaginable, but an economic event. To Hallstein now, what we have, he's saying, the legal Germanization, the invasion was a legal matter, but it was an economic event. And of course, other documentation that we have shows that IG Farben financed the rise of the Nazis during World War II. They played a key role in the perpetration of World War II. That's why the Farben directors were standing trial at Nuremberg. That's why they were there. But there's something else, because most shockingly of all, he actually stated that one of the most important laws to be introduced in the annexed countries was the law for the protection of the German blood and the German honour. In other words, he advocated the imposition of what were called the Nuremberg racial laws on the occupied countries. Now, the Nuremberg racial laws were the, the laws that marginalised Jews in German society. They prohibited them from having sexual relations with Germans or people of relate, German or related blood. An astonishing mindset, really, for the man who went on to become the founding president of the European Union. By now, I'm sure you're asking us, well, where is the evidence? Well, we have his handwritten notes for the speech. We have them online. There's a copy of one of the pages here. So we know what he said, because we have it in his own hand. But not just that. We have a copy of a newspaper article published the following day, which confirms the date and the venue of the speech. And it confirms who was there. In fact, it, who was there part was the entire Nazi elite of that region of Germany. And it summarizes what he talked about. And then we have a copy of the official invitation to the event, 
confirming the title of the speech, the venue, and the date. So we know what he said. We know when he said it. And we know where he said it. So at this point, I guess we have to ask ourselves, how did this man come to get to sign the treaties of Rome? The treaties of Rome were the founding documents of the European Union. They were signed in 1957. And they gave rise to the European Union that we know today. I put it to you that the only way this could happen, a mere 12 years after the end of World War II, would be if the people, or perhaps we say the entities, the corporations even, who stood to benefit from it, wanted it to be so. We find it impossible that a man who was so actively involved in Nazi Germany could possibly have hidden his past and a mere 12 years later emerge and signing a document that gave rise to the issuing of directives and ultimately the two that I talked about earlier, the Food Supplements Directive and the Herbal Directive. I talked a bit about the Lisbon Treaty earlier. Let's just talk a little bit about that as well. This was signed in 2007 and it came into law at the end of 2009. It's divided into two parts. And then at the end, there's a bunch of things called protocols tagged on the end. The reason there were so many arguments about the Lisbon Treaty is that it substantially changed the order in Europe. From now on, for the time being, European law has primacy over national law, not just here, not just in the UK, but in all 27 countries. But there's something else, because in all the time, I'm sure all of you, or many of you, most of you, remember the arguments, the debates that took place before the passing of this treaty. There's something that I never, ever saw mentioned during that time, and it was this. You see, the Lisbon Treaty, amongst the very many other things that we could talk about that it does tonight, what it actually does, it also places the EU as an entity above the law. And the reason I can say this is that one of the protocols that I talked about just earlier, that's tagged on the end of the treaty, something called the Protocol on the Privileges and Immunities of the European Union, says that the EU's premises and buildings are exempt from search. Now, <laughs> why in a democracy should government, I can call this other government, I guess, in a sense, why should buildings be exempt from search? But not just that, you see, because members of the European Commission, we talked about them earlier, are immune from legal proceedings in respect of acts performed by them in their official capacity, including their words spoken or written. But not just that, they continue to enjoy this immunity even after they have ceased to hold office. <laughs> I mean, think about it. You have 27 unelected technocrats who are the most powerful people in Europe. The European cabinet, if you like, the executive body. Unelected. The body, the block that they represent, its buildings are exempt from search. And the members of the Commission themselves, they are immune from legal proceedings being brought against them, either while they're acting in their official capacity or even after they cease to hold office. In any other country, in any other part of the world, if you had something like that, we would point our fingers and label it dictatorship. To all intents and purposes, this is now what we have. Because, you see, this man... This Herman Van Rompuy, to all intents and purposes, this man is our president. The Lisbon Treaty created the post that Van Rompuy now occupies, but unless I missed something, I didn't see any election being held for him to assume office. In fact, the only thing that was reported, it, it's unusual in fact, there was a meeting of the Bilderberg Group, which I'm sure all of you are probably quite familiar with, which took place about a week before he assumed office. 
This meeting took place in lavish surroundings on the outskirts of Brussels. It's unusual because it was reported in the media. Usually, the Bilderberg Group has not been used to being reported about. The Daily Telegraph, I recall, reported. The Guardian also mentioned this. It was widely reported. So he didn't have to stand before us and require us to vote for or against him. But the Bilderberg members and Rockefeller and the rest, they got to interview him and talk about policy to see whether he was the right man for the job, I guess. To all intents and purposes, this was his job interview. But this is the point, okay, this is the point of all this. If Van Rompuy had assumed office with the power that he now holds in any other country in the world, the EU, and they do this. I mean, not just the EU, our government does this. They point their fingers to these far off lands and say, we call for free and fair elections to be held. Well, if that's good enough for these other countries that our politicians point their fingers at, why isn't it good enough here? Why was this man installed? Because he was, he was installed without a vote. If we can label people like Van Rompuy dictators in other countries, because the powers that apply to the commission, the immunity from prosecution, apply to him as well. <clears throat> we wrote a book about this, and again, like the other books I've mentioned tonight, you can read it for free online. You can download the chapters individually as PDFs, or if you wish, you can buy a copy. But we consider this is important enough that as citizens, we have the right to know about it. We have the right to know how the Europe that we are living in, the Europe that has been grown in terms of its political powers before our eyes, how this came about. You see, one of the points I'm trying to make, I guess, is that there are plans that have been formulated many years in advance. In the politics of Europe, that we see around us now, it's my personal belief that very little happens by accident. In 2001, this man here, Romano Prodi, was the president of the European Commission. And in a forgotten piece in the Financial Times in 2001, Prodi was quoted as saying something very interesting. He said, he was talking about the introduction of the Euro currency, okay? And he said, I am sure the euro will oblige us to introduce a new set of economic policy instruments. He said, it is politically impossible to propose that now, but someday there will be a crisis and new instruments will be created. You see, I think that the architects of the euro, of the euro knew that a crisis would result from its introduction. But we know that Prony thought that, that he was the president of the commission, but they went ahead anyway. Why? Well, I think they went ahead knowing that the crisis that came allowed them to create new economic policy instruments, like the new fiscal treaty, which is the next treaty they want to bring in. They cause a problem and they propose a solution. You see, this pattern has been being played out in Europe for decades now, and it's still happening. The only thing we have with which to bring about a change to this is information. Because at the moment, not enough people are aware of the truth about what's been going on. And of course, we shouldn't delude ourselves into thinking that this problem is only something that's happening here in Europe, because already, around the world, there are quasi-EU blocks in the process of being built. In Southeast Asia, we have ASEAN. ASEAN is the Association of Southeast Asian Nations. And it's already said that they want to model themselves on the European Union. In Africa, we have the African Union, which already has an African Union Commission. And again, they've stated specifically they're wanting to model themselves on the European Union. There are two similar blocks in South America and so on. I guess all of us here are not under any illusion as to the size of the task that's facing us. And 
as I said to one or two people already here tonight in relation to some of the stuff that we discussed in the first half, I'm not pretending to have all the answers. And frankly, I don't think anybody has all the answers. So to close tonight, what I'd like to propose is just one or two things to do. Some of them are things to do, some of them are just things to think about, the means of altering our thinking, our understanding of all of this. The first one is to support the global movement for a new healthcare system. To us, to our foundation, this is what it's about. We don't believe that it's possible for a single country to easily make the sort of changes that need to be made. But regardless of that, it's a global problem. The problems that we're talking about here in Europe are mirrored pretty much in America. Different countries are in different places, in different situations, but it's a global movement for this. And it already exists in a sense, because I'm sure with the speakers that you get here on a regular basis, many of them and yourselves, you're interested in more natural ways of living. All of us, I guess, are waking up to the reality that the natural ways of living that are increasingly being replaced by patented seeds, GMOs, and artificial chemical pesticides and things, and of course the pharmaceutical drugs, we are coming to an understanding that there are better, safer, natural approaches to this. And healthcare is just another one of them. It fits in in the same way as the other natural approaches to agriculture and things that we're all also interested in. But it's a global healthcare system. It's a global change that's needed. But the vital first step, I guess, is something that doesn't apply to anybody here tonight. I'm sure most of us, or all of us, have long passed the point where we realise that we've been misled. Not just once, but many times in the past. This, my understanding of what happens here each week, based upon looking at the website, is that you get a succession of speakers who essentially repeat this in various ways to you, week after week. For the people, my, my feeling is that the people who have problems with any of this are the people who have problems with coming to terms with the fact that they've been misled. Because it's not easy sometimes to admit or to decide to come to the realisation, the acceptance that one may have been wrong and that perhaps one may have been misled. I didn't always do this. For, um, for 20 years before um, I came to work for Dr. Arthur, I was a musician. I was a, a session musician and keyboard player in London. And one of the people I worked with was, was this man here, Dave Stewart from the Eurythmics. And Dave's a very funny man, really, a very amusing man and a very nice man. But he's very clever as well because he knows how to use the media. And I learned things about the media and the way it is used, the way it operates, just from watching Dave and how he worked. The music industry generally is pretty good at using the media. It's a key aspect of the promotion of records, I guess. But in 1996, at the time when I was working with him, he publicly announced that he was suffering from something called Paradise Syndrome. I don't know whether any of you remember that. Maybe not. Maybe this has also vanished from the national consciousness. But he invented it. I mean, it was, he described it as a condition that occurs when your world is going fantastically well. You have everything materially that you could possibly want, but you become convinced that you're going to fall ill and die and lose it all. You know? And it was, he said it was a chronic psychological complaint, and he invented it himself, but with a few well-placed media phone calls and things, it was big news in the, the newspapers the following day, and it was a huge joke at the time. But the point is that even today, if you search around on media websites, you will still see references to Paradise Syndrome, and some of them take it seriously, as if it's a real condition. The message is that I guess when you look at a newspaper, you can look at the, the title of the newspaper, you can look at the date, and look at the price, but with everything that follows, buyer beware, take great caution, because what you read may not necessarily be true. Some of the things that you come to believe, that the media brings us to believe, may not necessarily be true. And it's very difficult sometimes 
to sort out the truth from the fiction. And this is why I readily agreed to come here tonight to talk with the, where I can see what I knew straight away, where a group of people who are interested in the truth. It's so important. The movement of life is now the umbrella campaign for our foundation. It's a global campaign for health, peace and social justice. Because we don't believe that the changes that need to be made to our system of healthcare in Europe and around the world can be made unless social justice and peace occur. The peace question is a, a talk in itself, and I'm sure you've had many people talk about that. The planet right now is in a situation that's <coughs> almost unprecedented for over 50 years. There were so many areas, politically, economically, our healthcare systems, in which we are coming to the realisation that the ways we have been doing things are wrong. Peace is clearly a prerequisite for health. Good health is not going to be possible if the planet descends into nuclear war. There's three legs to this campaign. Health for all, ending what I was talking about earlier, the global dependency on patented chemical pharmaceutical drugs and the dependence of our healthcare systems upon this. Food for all, ending what we call the GMO madness. The fact that there are people, politicians, saying publicly that the world needs GM food to feed the world is a lie. There's good research showing this is not the case. The reason GMOs exist is because they can be patented. You can't say you invented an organic banana, a naturally occurring banana seed or an apple seed, but if you can patent the seed, the same principles that apply when I talked earlier about patenting drugs also apply. And finally, energy for all. I'm sure you must have had a long succession of speakers talking about alternative forms of energy and how they've been suppressed in the interests of the petrochemical cartel. A couple of things, jumping back now to where we started in the healthcare arena. To bring about the changes in the healthcare systems involves education. Ultimately, I believe that the sort of things I was talking about tonight will eventually be taught in schools. But actually, we don't need to wait until that time to begin educating our children about basic principles, about how the cells operate, the relationship between the body, cells, and nutrition. We have a campaign dealing specifically with this. And there's a little course on this campaign, and kids can download a little certificate when they finish the course. But spreading information about natural health, natural health alternatives, is vital to turning around the super tanker that is currently controlling our global healthcare system. And a cancer free world, our scientists believe, is possible. They believe the research has reached a point whereby this is now a foreseeable goal that can be achieved. But it requires people to share the information that there are alternatives. This is what our cancer-free world campaign is about. Two more little thoughts. Despite the criminal, in some cases, behaviour of our politicians, examples such as the, the expenses scandal being only one of the latest to come to mind, I think that we should not allow ourselves to become politically disillusioned. If we disengage from the political process, we essentially allow them to go on and interfere to an ever greater extent in our lives. It's not an easy issue and I'm not standing here saying who one should and should not vote for or against. But I strongly believe that if we decide not to vote, we cannot 
look ourselves in the face and say, well, I'm doing my bit to try to overturn it, because ultimately these things require changes in government. I don't see any possibility anytime soon that we're going to move to a situation where we don't have government. The changes that need to be made have to involve changes in government. One more thing. Change, we believe, is only possible if one can turn knowledge, information, into action. It's like saying, don't just be a truth seeker, become a truth sharer. If the things that I've been talking to you about tonight stay inside your own heads, as it were, well, essentially I've failed. I've been talking to some people and hopefully you've got some of it, you may agree with some of it, you may say, well, I want to know more about that. But the point is, if there's something tonight that has touched you in any way, in what I said, please share it. Become a truth sharer. I think we're going to do a few questions in a little while, but for now, thank you very much. Questions? Yeah. Um, so, yeah, ask away. Well, it's not a question, it's just about the Treaty of Rome. Apparently, the Treaty of Rome, it was blank when they signed it, and then they filled it in afterwards. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know, but again, I'm only interested in what I can prove. The things that I've been talking about tonight, I can prove. We have documentation that's online to show the truth about these things. That, maybe, I don't know. But I, I, I don't know it and I can't prove it. If you can prove it, if you can provide the proof, not just somebody saying it, I'd be very interested. Right, I think it was from um, Hendrik on Red Eyes who did a whole thing on the European Union and he said that it was, um, when he did his little documentary thing on it, he said that, that, that it mm. was blank. It was, it was Hendrik, yeah. Yeah, it, yeah. it was blank beforehand and, and um, they filled it in afterwards. I just wanted to get it through, you know, and then a lot of time. Well, I mean, on the basis that I guess we're learning not to trust these people, I mean, could I stand here and say that's not possible? No, I couldn't. Could I say that that's true? I don't know. I mean, if, if, if someone can show me evidence, I would certainly be very interested. I think it was just the email from yeah. Henry. What was his proof? What was his proof for this? Um, I can't remember now, but I mean, if you just email him his episode, right, he can yeah. tell you exactly yeah. that. I'm sure we'll probably do a whole lot of thing on it. Interesting. In fact, if you go onto his website, you can see the, right. the thing that he did in um, the back. Yeah. Well, certainly we're dealing with tricky individuals here, so he um, said, nothing uh, surprises me anymore. Because Barroso was in the uh, comedy part of the we thought he joined the thing Who's next? Okay, lady here. Hi, first I'd like to say thank you. It's a really good talk, really well, interesting. Thank you. It's it's I mean, really a pleasure. It's not often that one gets to see smiling, interested, nodding, <laughs> intelligent, awake faces. You might not be able to answer my question, but I just wanted to know if you know um, at the beginning when you were speaking about the studies on cancer, mm -hmm. was any of the subjects um, smokers at all? Um, I don't know. But I'll say this, I do know, is that one of the things that smoking does is to destroy vitamin C. Yeah, well that's my right, yeah, yeah, yeah. There are, um, there is, um, I think it's the Journal of the Canadian Medical Association, that's from memory. There's a, an interesting study where they gave three cancer sufferers um, intravenous vitamin C and other micronutrients. And two of them made full recoveries and were, remained cancer free. The third one remained, if I recall correctly, cancer-free for about seven years, even though she was uh, a long-term, lifelong smoker. She died after seven years. But there is already evidence in medical journals about intravenous vitamin C, and it's, it's growing. Yeah, because I've, I've read that um, just one cigarette depletes your vitamin C for a day. Yeah, I mean, I think Linus Pauling said something about, uh, he said it was, each cigarette destroys 25 milligrams of vitamin C or something. So you've got to be eating a damn good diet if you smoke, I tell you. Yeah. The, the, the gentleman here. Yeah, I just wanted to follow up that point because um, it's interesting that the, the powers that they seem to be going to extraordinary lengths to curtail the smoking. Um, 
you know, there's so many places you can't smoke now, mm -hmm. and they're covering up cigarettes in supermarkets. Mm -hmm. So that would seem to be at odds uh, if they were disinterested in our health. Um, Why are they going to switch lengths to? I think that's um, political pressure, I think. And I, 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 I mean, witness, for example, um, what happened when um, they brought in the smoking ban um, here and suddenly bars and clubs and pubs and restaurants became smoke free. There was very little in the way of complaints from the general public who are the majority non smokers. The smokers, I guess, complained, but got used to it. But no, I think this is personally, I believe, this is political pressure being brought. You know. so where though and why? As I say, if they are as disinterested in the health. Yeah. Um, I, well, I mean, again, this is an interesting area. I mean, again, as I say, I don't have all the answers, but I do perceive, um, in part, what one is seeing is the, the pharma industry stealing the, the tobacco industry's customers. You know, this is what all the smoking patches and anti-smoking drugs and things are all about. You know, if you think of it about business, you know, well, maybe you could say that the pharma industry has, you know, an interest. But I don't know. I don't have all the answers to that. It's an interesting question. So, uh, I, 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 will, uh, I will elaborate on that. It's because they don't want you to smoke cannabis. <laughs> <laughs> because of what it does, it wakes you up. And they don't want you to wake up. So that's why they brought in the smoking yeah. ban, because they don't want us to be like Amsterdam. It's not, it's because you rebel, don't you? You just smoke even more. No, it 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 wakes up. These aren't <laughs> truths, are they? They're just matters of opinion. So no, um, let's stick. Does anybody have another question? Yeah, we can do. We can talk about this. Uh, Andy's yeah. right. The, the gentleman here. Can you tell us something about the Dr. Rath products, which help to heal no. heart disease and cancer? No, that's. I don't work for that company, and it's not what I'm here to talk about. Okay. Just, the gentleman here, the yeah, gentleman here. Just, just what I said to you earlier, I mean, it's not a question of subject, it is about design, it's moving about the resource-based economy, and again, it just shines the fact that problems would be eliminated in, in that type of uh, system. You talk about money, and you talk about uh, political action. You know, I don't look to politicians anymore, and a lot of people aren't, to be fair, I don't think political area is, is, is any more the place, because they are, they are corrupted, they are lobbied, so they are whatever. And as you say, in, in, in a resource-based economy, you'd have an open book, open source environment anyway, with no patents, and, and, and your whole ambition would be to create a good health period. and that's why I'm So the question becomes, concerned. how do we get to that? Yeah, yeah, I mean I'm obviously heavily involved and I still am very committed, I, I haven't diminished my view that that's the way to go, it's all space. I mean the World Socialist Group have got the same idea, moneyless society, I know it could be New World Order, but I hope it isn't, you know, I, 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 I kind of keep on going around that. It just goes back to the question about the money, the money system. That's what yeah. the same happens in Russia, though, isn't it? The promise of utopia. Well, but we're in utopia now, officially. We are supposed to be. The gentleman at the back. Can you enlighten us as to um, any nutritional things? You were talking about, were you talking about cellular nutrition? Yeah. Cellular nutrition, yeah. yeah. Only in the sense um, that um, I was explaining that um, disease begins and occurs at the level of the human cell. And it's what our scientists refer to this approach to healthcare as, they call it cellular medicine. This is the, the term that they are using to describe this therapeutic approach. So is there any practical things that we can do? Or... Well, the easiest one is to eat properly. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, just, and it's the same message that we get from our governments, essentially. But of course, they're not telling us the whole story. They're not telling us why we have to eat properly and where disease begins and occurs. But you know, eating uh, a healthy diet, you know, lots of fruit and vegetables and salads and raw food is a good start. That's really the right approach. They showed it in um, New Zealand last year when people were having the swine flu and the yearly flu. They just injected them with one gram of vitamin C on entry to the hospital. First thing they're giving them, before they even start talking about lifestyle and how they live, because they know that's going to give them a regenerative Chance straight away. This was Australia. Yeah. I think it was uh, New Zealand. New Zealand. When? Um, last year that was. This was the gentleman in uh, Australia who had swine flu. He was near to death, and they also found that he had uh, New Zealand was it? Thank you. And he had uh, leukemia as well, concurrent with that. And it's a long story, isn't it? But ultimately, he recovered using high dose vitamin C, and the leukemia disappeared at the same time. What dose? 
Well, I think it's one gram. Initially, it was intravenous, and then it was uh, high doses of other types of vitamin C. Anybody else? The gentleman here. Okay. Um, I've been looking up Dr. Rath on the internet, and uh, I saw the, some of the criticisms of mm. Dr. Dr. Rath. Mm -hmm. Certain people, is it um, uh, Ernst, Ed Sardin, <laughs> Ed Sardin, Ed Sardin, Simon Singh, and yes, yes. Ben Goldacre, and the, I don't know if the Cochrane Foundation, the system that used, I don't know if they've covered it yet, but uh, but that, but let's say the first thing, uh, they've they've been critical of, of Dr. Raff's all the stuff in the yeah, first part of the talk. Yeah. Uh, what's your opinion on that? Um, well, Ed Zard Ernst, that's a funny one, isn't it, really? I mean, Ed Zard Ernst was the self-styled um, UK's only professor of complementary therapies. And yet, bizarrely, he spent all of his time criticising them and saying that they didn't work. <laughs> I wonder why that might be. Um, but generally speaking, um, if one goes up against an orthodoxy in any field, and I'm talking about historically now, you know, when, when Galileo said that the Earth revolved around the Sun, you know, and rather than the entire universe revolving around the Earth, he was ridiculed. You know? If you go up against conventional, conventional thinking, the orthodoxy in any scientific field, it invariably involves people discrediting you. It, you have to expect that people are not going to say, oh, yeah, yeah, you might be right. You know? Because the implications of this, which I've tried to talk about this evening, are huge. You, know? you have a $1 trillion a year industry for a start. It's not going to be very happy about it. I mean, you know, that should tell you something straight away. That there's an economic interest in this. Root cause. Yeah. Well, some, some, some drugs are painted before the disease is... Well, well, yeah. I mean, yeah. I mean, some of those, I mean, some of the people I mentioned and, and I think have actually took on the big pharma or have actually been critical of them as well. What, in a major way? Well, ben Goldacre, I think, doesn't like big pharma so much. He has spoken out about them. He and is, I, it, and um, the Cochrane Foundation was it found out about Roboxetin, uh, which is an antidepressant, and did a systematic review and found stuff, and it, had it taken off. Because it actually, the, the, I think the company was found to have hidden, buried their evidence. So they've, 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 they've certainly attacked the big pharma as well. Not being specific, but I think sometimes what happens is when people are pushed into a corner, they will begin to criticise, they will join the criticism so that it cannot be labelled that they are pro something. And I think in some of these individuals' cases, perhaps that may be what we are seeing happening. But ultimately, you know, I'm not going to try and second guess what anybody's motives are. I'm more interested in putting down what we consider to be the evidence and then letting people make their own minds up. If people want to say, well, this is not true, I haven't seen any yet one or rather, a better thing to say would be, our researchers in California haven't yet seen any one good scientific argument that refutes the basic stuff that I was telling you in the first half of the talk tonight. I haven't seen, in fact, anybody, Goldacre or any of them, actually confront the specific scientific statements, the studies, the 80 studies that our researchers have published. I haven't yet seen a proper critical analysis of those, of any of those people. Have you? Um, Rath threatened to sue, I think I read. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Should, should we have one more question? Because the lady, Good idea. Uh, the lady has already asked one. If, if there's nobody else, we should have the lady here. If there's somebody else, we should give somebody else a turn. Just a small question. A small question. What would you like us to do to support the Rath movement? The things that I've talked about at the end of the talk supporting the World Health Alphabetization campaign, supporting our campaign for a cancer-free world, supporting the movement of life, supporting the, the concepts. How do you do that? By bringing the websites, for example, to the attention of other people, sharing the information on the websites with other people. Follow up your own information. There's information out there now, as I said, on Gerson and Hoxie and uh, the Italian guy who's talking about sodium bicarbonate. There's a lot of information out there which can be absolutely looked at to get. One final question from Lynn, because it was actually Lynn who brought this about. It was Lynn who yeah. said that I should come here and talk to Claire and Andy. So 
Did she send out says, links and she prints she does. documents about vaccines and vitamin C and healthy options for children? Probably the most active person yeah. I know. So round of applause for Liz. Please have a back here, everybody. Very good. Got a question from Liz. Is there any point in emailing our MPs and EU representatives? That's a very good question. I think there is, yes. Because if you want to change something that they're doing, you have to let them know. See, I believe, in fact, I know from having met with some of them, that there are people within these bodies who actually agree and who know the truth. But what they say usually when you confront them, they say, well, when I feel, when I know that the majority of public will is behind this, well, then I can be more open and say I support you. But at the current time, we're not in a position where the majority of people either know about this or have arrived at the place where many of us have arrived at in our own thinking. So yes, there is. Because if you don't, we can't really complain if they go away and then do something else that's contrary to what we're asking them to do. They may still go away and do something else anyway, but at least if you write to them, you then can look away and say, well, now that they know what I think, you know. But it's not democracy. It's not democracy. It's, it's, a, it's a delusion. One, one tick in a box every four or five years is not democracy. We can do better than this. So what we should do, if, if we email anybody, we should send a copy of that email to all that things and get them to email yeah. as well. All these things. All these things and more. Should we say thank you very much, Paul? Because yeah. as I said, I think it's been a riveting talk. <laughs>